talk, I want to take a big picture approach to this, and I want to talk about women in Canadian elections as both voters, but also as part of the process in terms of being candidates and nominees in elections. So I want to kind of, rather than dig in deep, I just want to step back and give a big picture approach to this. And I want to thank uh, Melanie Thomas. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today is based on research we did together on the 2015 election. So I want to set the, we the scene for women in Canadian democracy. And part of the way that I do it is by focusing on 2015 election, national election, to kind of give some examples of what I'm trying to uh, talk about. And I have to thank David Coletto, who was the speaker last night, because uh, he shared the data that he was collected for the 2015 election with Melanie and I to be able to say things about gender and uh, voting in the election uh, itself. So just briefly, that, that data set uh, had 3,000 Canadians, roughly a little bit more than 3,000 Canadians. It was in the field October 15th to 19th, though so just before the election date of the 19th. 30% uh, of the sample had voted already in advanced polls, 70% had yet to vote. So the things that I'm going to be ta showing you about voting in, is voting and voting intention, and they're combined. It's an internet panel, so it wasn't a telephone on. We were talking about polling in an earlier uh, panel today. So what are the points I want to make? The first point, uh, first point I want to make is that um, Canadian elections, uh, and politics I would argue more broadly, are largely silent on issues of importance to women, and they do it in a couple of ways. Um, one is that issues that are important to women are not discussed, but second, issues that are important to women are not framed as women's issues. They're framed in a different way, and I think both of those are important. I think there was a potential in 2015 to have a good discussion about women's issues when Up for Debate tried to organize a women's uh, debate, leader debate. And that fell through in part because uh, Harper refused to participate. And once Harper refused to participate, um, uh, Mulcair also pulled out. And then that sort of left it up in the air. And there was an internet version of it, but it didn't get the kind of attention that it might have gotten any, uh, otherwise. And uh, it was already mentioned today that three of the women uh, that led the campaigns uh, for the top three parties were women. Uh, three of the campaign organizers, uh, Katie Telford for the Libs, Jenny Byrne for CPCs, and Anne McGrath for the NDP. So there, was, there were women who were organizing campaigns, and there was a potential there. And also, I think uh, Trudeau and Mulcair both declared themselves as feminists, so it seemed to me we might have had an election that actually talked about uh, women in a way that hadn't happened at least since 1984, uh, but that didn't play itself out. Um, so. I want to talk about just three things that happened during that election to kind of illustrate my point. Uh, child care was discussed to some extent uh, in 2015 in the election, in part because the Conservatives had made it their issue by increasing the payment that went to families just before the start of the campaign. It was Christmas, you know, Christmas in October, or no, it was Christmas in August. Uh, so the focus, though, however, of that issue was on families. It was not on women. There was no discussion about these payments helping women get into the workforce, because largely that's what childcare actually does. It's tremendously important for getting women into the, into the workforce. Uh, but it's about framing the issue, and none of the parties actually did that. They all framed it in terms of families. Then, of course, we have the niqab, which was a huge issue during the 2015 election. Uh, external factors introduced it into the campaign because the uh, Federal Court of Appeal actually made a ruling during the campaign, and so it became an issue. Uh, the Conservatives said that they were going to appeal that issue or that, that decision because they wanted to maintain the ban on wearing face veils uh, during citizenship ceremonies. The Liberals uh, and the NDP, after much, I think, it was, a harder, it was a harder point for the, for the New Democrats because of their importance in Quebec. It was a very difficult issue for them because Quebecers fully support uh, the ban on the kneecap. You have to know a little bit of the history of Quebec, but it was a huge issue for them. And so uh, not supporting the ban was very problematic for them. But in terms of what I'm talking about, this was the time, to my knowledge, that any of the parties talked about women's equality. And it was talked about in the context of telling them what they could and could not wear. I think that is so telling in and of itself that that's the one time that we actually talked about women's equality uh, in the last little while in a national election. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> 
Uh, then we also had briefly the only one party talked about gender equality in cabinet. That was the Liberals under uh, Trudeau. And again, I spoke a little bit about that during the roundtable. And uh, while there was support for that particular decision, there was also a lot of opposition that was framed in terms of women not necessarily having the, the skills to be able to sit in those positions. And I found that also very interesting. Point number two, I think, is an important one. Women are as, if not more, likely to vote than men are. I think most people don't recognize that. Women tend not to participate in some parts of politics, but in terms of voting, they absolutely vote. And why do they do that? Most of the literature tells us because they have a much stronger sense of duty. Their duty is much stronger to, as a citizen, let's put it that way. And the point I want to make about that one is simply that women will participate if there is a reason to do so. It's not as if women will not. They will, but they have to have the right conditions, I would argue. Point number three is that Canadians are equally likely to vote for women and men candidates. They make no distinctions, and that's important for what I want to talk about later, about the assumptions that parties make about women's ability to win in an election. And I don't have tables for this, you have to trust me on this, the research tells us again and again and again that there is no distinction made uh, between female and male candidates. Um, Point number four is that women and men don't vote necessarily in the same way. So who they vote for, while they may turn out in the same numbers, who they vote for is not the same. Two gender gaps tend to dominate in Canadian uh, politics at the national level. Uh, women are less likely to support the, the CPC, the Conservative Party of Canada. In 2015, that was about a seven point gap. That's that first line in that table. Uh, men are less likely to support the NDP, and that's a four-point gap in 2015. And that's a fairly consistent trend in, in Canada since the, about the late 1980s. So that's a fairly consistent trend. It's argued to reflect things like structural differences, educational differences, income differences, so on. It's said to reflect uh, values and issue positions that might differ between women and men, partly the support of feminism. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found for 2015 and how it isn't really about those things. Point number five is that women are often, I think it's interesting to think about the discussion we had earlier on some of the panels about strategic voting. Uh, women are more undecided in how they're going to vote later into the campaign. It takes them longer to make their decision about who they want to actually vote for. And I think you can see that as a negative thing, that they're undecided, but it could also be that they're just waiting to make up their mind because they want more informo information. So they may be smarter voters. That's why I'm, that's a spin I'm going to put on it. That's why are actually smarter about it. But part of it may be that they have less information about politics, and we know that's true. If you do, if you do research on political knowledge, it's true that women have less political knowledge. Uh, depends on what we're asking about specifically. If we're talking about who's the leader and what's the position of this party on an issue, women are less likely to know those, know those things. On the other hand, if you ask them about political issues closer to home, who would you call if you need to access this for your children? They know that more than men do. So it's about the kind of issues you're asking about as well. But generally, if we're talking about national big picture things, women tend to be less, less knowledgeable. And this particular table shows you that at the end of the campaign, so this is October 15th to 17th. If you asked women and men uh, which party has a platform that's closest to your own, and that's a question that Melanie and I came up with and David uh, very thankfully added it to the, to the survey so that we could get at this question of strategic voting, which is very hard to get a, get a handle on. But at the end of the campaign, 32% of women were still unsure about which party had a platform that was closest to their own. And 20% of men still didn't have an idea of which party had a platform that was closest to their own. And I say this point for both women and men to make us understand that not everybody knows about politics. Even in the, at the end of a campaign, there are lots of people who are still uncertain. So we have to keep that in mind, I think. Um, but it may be that there's more, it may be that men are saying they know which party is closest to their own and they're just guessing and we don't really know that. So that's another thing that research tells us that men are more likely to guess uh, than women are. But the key thing here is uh, that 
women's political engagement is different than men's. So as participants in the system, we can see some differences. And this is very complicated, and I, but I just want to simplify it for a minute. Really what this table does is actually just try to get at the heart of why women and men voted differently in 2015. And it's a, it's a logistic regression model, very complicated, but we don't need to go into the dynamics of this particular model. Really all I want you to think about are, there's a couple of things that are true that stand out for me in this, in this table. The first line tells us the importance of gender in terms of the difference in voting, and this is for the Conservative Party alone. So I'm just looking at the Conservative Party. The negative uh, entry there tells us that women are less likely to vote for that party in 2015. Then the next set of this, the second model adds a whole bunch of controls for that to try and explain what's going on. And as you'll see, the, the entry there becomes less statistically significant, which means that what we have now is less of an effect. So it means we're, we're explaining something about what's going on. So what are the key factors that tend to explain this? In this particular election, we had two things that stood out. And we were constrained by the questions that were in the survey. So it's possible that there are other things that we didn't have to be able to put in there might help us to understand it better. But really, leader evaluations by far and away dominated any, uh, any, any factor that could explain why people were voting the way they were. So in this particular election, it really was about leadership. And although it, you don't see it there, women and men had very visceral and different uh, um, reactions to Stephen Harper. Women were much less likely to be supportive of him, and men were much more likely to support him. And what's the, what's the operationalization of this variable? Uh, the survey asked, I think, 18 questions and actually had just characteristics, and you had to rate each leader up from 0 to 10 whether you thought it met them or, or characterized them properly. Things like uh, strong leader, trustworthy, tired, like they had a good range of questions. So in this particular case, that's one of the things that helps to explain differences in voting between women and men was their reactions to the leaders. Uh, the other thing is one of the issues there, fund public daycare, was another one. If you, were, if you were supportive of funding public daycare as opposed to giving money directly to families, you were less likely to vote for the conservatives in this particular election. And women were slightly more likely to support that issue. So that explains again some of the, why am I going through this? Because women and men don't vote the same way. There are differences in how we respond to issues, how we respond to leaders, and that plays itself out in how we vote as citizens. Point six, um, what I just said. Some, same parties, same leaders, same issues, same campaign, same election, women and men don't always respond the same way. Now, it's not just, they asked me not just to talk about women as participants in elections, but also to talk about representation. So this is a, very simple trend line that tells us how many women have been elected as MPs to the House of Commons since 1917. And there are a couple of things to highlight here. Uh, 2016 is the highest level we've ever had, 26% of women in the House. We've had growth periods between 1972 and 97 was a tremendous growth period. 26 to 2011, I argue, was another one. Uh, but we've also had periods of stagnation. 1917 to 1972, and 1997 to 2006, which is a very recent one in which you really don't see any growth at all. So point seven is that there's never an automatic growth in women's representation and we shouldn't take it for granted. You will get people that will tell you, you just have to wait long enough, it'll happen. It's not gonna happen. You have to take action and try and move things forward. Point number eight is that the growth since 97 has been tremendously slow. And, I mean, from 21% to 26%, five percentage points in 18 years. So the reality is it would be 120 years before we reach parity if we continue at that growth rate. That's, I would argue, too long uh, to reach parity. Um, next, how do we explain what's happening in terms of women's representation uh, in the House? I think without question we have to talk about uh, parties. But before I get to that, I'm not just going to say it's parties' fault. I think a good model for thinking about this is supply and demand. So parties demand candidates and nominees, but women supply themselves as candidates and nominees. So let's think about both of those things. Um, so the supply is women's willingness to step forward. 
and I think it's been mentioned already, it's, it's often the case that it's about because they can, because they want to, and because they have opportunities. That's a nice model for explaining why people participate. So I guess the question becomes, why would women want to? And you could say the same for Aboriginal people. Rather than saying, why don't they vote, I think you should say, why would they? <laughs> Seems like a good point. Uh, let's flip it around. But one of the things, again, that came up in the panel at noon was we need to think about gender norms and gender expectations. I, I think, again, the whole discussion about merit in the cabinet made it very, very clear to women that politics is really not for you. Even in 2016, politics is not for you. Uh, you need to think twice because if you get involved, people will question your ability. Uh, we know indirectly women's political interest is lower, women's political engagement is lower, their political knowledge is lower, and I would argue that all of those things are in part because of the gender norms and gender expectations that we place on women. So it's not as if they are responsible for it, but it's, I would argue, a rational response to a system that tells you repeatedly you are not meant to be here. I, and Rachel Notley's treatment online at the moment in terms of, I mean, every leader I think has some negative, uh, but when that negative becomes about killing and assassination and uh, sexual violence against political leaders, I've got a real problem with this. I mean, this is not how one should participate in politics. It should be about a rational discussion about the issues. Okay. Um, opportunities, they need to be asked. That was already mentioned. Women need to be asked more. It, it's more the case that women have to be asked to participate for them to want to participate. Men tend to go anyway. They don't have to be asked. So it's also about the opportunities that are available to them. It's less about their ability. Can they? Because women have advanced in education. We still don't have the same income and so on. We still have the same occupations. I think that matters a lot for networking and who are, you know, the circle from which we pull our politicians. But the key is that, I think one key we need to remember as well is that it's not just about women versus men. How many women are in the house versus how many men. It's also about the kinds of women that are there. And I think if we had greater representation for women, we would have greater diversity in the representation of the kinds of women that we're getting in the house. Because we know intersectionality tells us that you're not just a woman. You're a woman and you're something else in addition to that. It might be class. It might be immigrant. It might be a minority group, it, aboriginal. We want all of these women to be in there, partly because they're doubly disadvantaged or triply disadvantaged. And those are the very people that I would argue we need to have in our legislatures to be able to bring some uh, balance to the discussion. But really what you have to think about too are parties. And parties play a primary role. I think the word was gatekeepers that was used. They are the gatekeepers of nominees. They are the, the decision makers in terms of who actually can get to the House. Um, their perceptions are what really matters in terms of who gets nominated and who doesn't. The electoral system has been mentioned. The electoral system creates incentives for who you want and who you think is going to be a successful candidate. And the first past the post system with winner take all makes it especially difficult, uh, I think, for women to get into the system uh, because the stakes are so high. I think we know from PR evaluations of PR systems when you can have several people, you're much more likely to have women come forward uh, and be seen as potential uh, candidates in terms of winning. I've already talked at the panel about merit and how hard that is to pin down, but parties have to make those assessments in part about what is meritorious, and I think that is framed in a gendered framework. Uh, what, is, what are the characteristics you want to see in your candidates? You want them to be strong, right, aggressive. Except if you're a woman, being strong and aggressive is not necessarily seen as a good thing. Uh, we can talk a little bit about sacrificial lambs and the degree to which parties select women to be more likely to run in uh, ridings that have less chance of winning. There's a debate at the moment in Canadian politics about the degree to which that's the case, but the most recent evidence suggests that there is still some of that happening. And that if women and, if women and men were appointed in equal numbers to successful ridings, women's numbers would actually improve in the House. What's key from this table is not all parties are equally co committed to getting women in the House of Commons. Uh, the further to the right you are, the less likely you are to have to have any kind of institutional framework in your party to uh, increase the numbers of women. The more to the left you are, the more likely you are to do it. 
As you can see there, the Conservatives, 17 or 19 percent of their candidates were women. The NDP, 43 percent of their candidates were women. Key here is concerted efforts on the part of parties make a difference. Parties can keep women from getting in, but parties can also encourage women from getting in. So it's, it matters what those parties do. Um, strong electoral showing, you know, which party is successful is going to determine the success of women in a House or legislature in Canada. The more likely the NDP is to be successful, like in Alberta, the more likely you are to have women that actually sit in caucus and in government. So it's important for us to remember that it's not whether women choose to run, it's also about who the parties are asking to run. That's an important question as well. So what are my sort of final points? Key factors, I think gender silence. We're not even talking about gender anymore or women's issues. It's kind of a non-issue, if you will. And I think that matters for the degree to which women participate or not. Uh, women vote, even though they're less interested, less engaged, less knowledgeable, they still vote. So they could participate if we had the right set of circumstances for asking them. Canadians don't discriminate between women and men, so it's important that parties know that. I don't think parties know that, and I think parties make assumptions about voters that aren't always uh, reflective of reality. Women are not equally attracted to or vote for the same parties, and that's reflected, I think, in part of where you see the numbers of women. Uh, but having said that, every party could find a woman to run in for them in a riding in Canada. I mean, saying that there's a difference between women and men at the aggregate doesn't mean that you don't have women who support each of the parties. That is certainly the case, and they could find women. Parties are tremendously important uh, for women's success in terms of representation. Things would change if we had a different electoral system. I think the incentives for parties would be very different. But I think the last thing is quite simply that women continue to receive signals, even in 2016, that politics is not for them. And be careful if you choose to go into that because you will receive a special kind, I think, of attention that isn't always, I think, uh, deserved, nor do I think is healthy for democracy. Uh, and I'll stop there. It's not that women are surprised to be asked. It's that women downplay their skills. So if you say to them, I'd like you to run, their immediate response will be, I don't, I don't really know enough, I, give me some time, I need some more. Whereas men will say, sure, or actually come forward themselves and say, I, I think I want to run. So it's about, in, in the U.S., there's a big study called it political ambition. Women have less political ambition. So is it, is it women's fault that they have less political ambition? I think part of what I was trying to say is if they have less political ambition, it's because of the, it's the nature of the system that decides what are the skills and characteristics and things that you need to be a successful politician. And I think women, by virtue of nothing other than their gender, are at a disadvantage because women are not supposed to act that way. So you have to go counter to model in order to be successful. And I think, so that's what I mean by not blaming the victim. I think it's a, I think I said in the round table, I think it's a, it's not just, an, it's not the media's fault. It's a cultural thing that needs to be changed. That's huge. Right? But I think it's part, I, I'd like to think we're seeing some shifts, as I said, slowly, but I think part of it is coming to an understanding that we have to be careful about the assumptions we make, about the stereotypes and all of those things about what is a proper role for women, what is a proper role for men. Yeah. Yeah. And, and other sexed individuals as well. I mean, I'm talking very much in a binary here, but I think, yeah, I don't want to limit it to that either.